Welcome to the bathhouse. We are standing on the corner of St Barnabas Road and Mill Road with St Barnabas Church behind us. We're looking across Mill Road to the bathhouse on the corner of Guida Street. This photo was taken five years ago. The street scene is almost the same today. In 1908, the scene was very different. This photo shows almost the same view. It is April. There has been a late fall of snow and from the look of the road, the surface of Mill Road, it was an already busy thoroughfare. I have no idea why the policemen are guarding a lamppost. Behind them is the reason for showing you this photograph. It is Guida House, built by James Naden in 1850. It was one of the first houses to be built along Mill Road. In 1863, the house was put up for sale. The auction particulars said it commanded picturesque views of the Gog Magog Hills. Who on Mill Road can boast that view today? At the end of the century, a succession of doctors lived here, which gave the house its nickname, the Doctor's House. By this time, Mill Road, the, the Mill Road area was growing fast and Guida House was in the way. You can see on this map that Guida Street had been developed behind it, but Guida House narrowed the junction with Mill Road. It had to go. The Borough of Cambridge bought it in 1912 under a compulsory purchase order for £1,250, which was a considerable sum at that time. And then they pulled it down. The road was widened, but nothing happened to the rest of the site. It was at one time considered for a school, but declared unsuitable. The population of Cambridge had expanded enormously. By 1901, it was 30,000 people. With the arrival of the railway and other associated trades and industries, the Mill Road area grew rapidly from rural to urban. The existing sanitation was inadequate, hence the need for a local bathhouse. New terraced houses might have had a privy in the backyard, but other than the cold water tap in the kitchen, there was no indoor plumbing. For many years, the Borough Council, remember Cambridge was not a city until 1950, put off making a decision about the building of a public bathhouse. Sites were considered and rejected, the great and the good questioned the need for public baths. One argument was that as students were strangers to indoor plumbing, why should the common populace be any different? It was not until 1923 that the Public Health Committee agreed to have plans drawn up. The contract was awarded to local builder Mr C. Kerridge who you will not be surprised to learn had submitted the lowest tender of £7,331. The borough accounts show that he was held to this budget to the very penny. Whilst building works progressed, the committee busied itself with important decisions such as the appointing of staff, ordering uniforms, towels and soap. Male attendants were to be paid three pounds a week, but women only two pounds. Soap cost 53 shillings a, a hundredweight. That is about two pounds 70 pence for 50 kilos of soap. Baths were to cost four pence, including a towel and a sliver of soap. Please do not think you got a large fluffy bath towel. They were small three foot by 18 inches. Male members of the committee left the selecting of, wait for it, headdresses for the female staff to the lady committee members who always attended committee meetings wearing their best hats. This is a photograph of the front of the building. 
It was built of red brick with stone facings. The windows are set high for privacy. The entrance is intended to be grand. If it were not for the chimneys, it could easily have been a school. This is the north end of the building. It was a yard and stables for Guida House and its horses. It became a storage area for the bathhouse and in 1985 became a play area. When this photo was taken in 2015, the old play equipment was shortly to be replaced. This play area was dedicated to the memory of Hector Peterson, who died on the 16th of June, 1976, aged 13. He was a South African schoolboy who was shot and killed during the Soweto uprising when police opened fire on students who were protesting about the enforcement of teaching in Afrikaans. This photo was published around the world. The playground was rededicated in December 2016 with the erection of new, a new plaque following Cambridge City Council using a development money to refurbish the play area. We are now looking at the back of the bathhouse you will agree this is not its most interesting side. 100 years ago, you would have been standing not in a car park, but in the gardens and orchards of Guida House and Cornetta Villa. Continuing around the building, we are now on the south or Mill Road end. The public toilets built in 2002 at a cost of 200,000 pounds were to replace much earlier conveniences. I wonder what Mr. Kerridge would have made of that budget. Behind the railings, there is a small yard which gave staff access to the original bathhouse laundry. On our way back to the front door, we pass an area of red brick behind the telephone box. Here, customers queuing for baths, or perhaps for the phone, rubbed coins into the soft bricks and scratched in their names. These are a permanent reminder of the users of the building. The 40 foot high chimney must have been a challenge for Mr. Kerridge and his builders. It is now redundant, but it remains a local landmark. The two bathing areas within the building, each containing eight or nine slipper baths, were ventilated by copper cupolas. These cupolas regular blow off, regularly blow off the roof and has to be replaced by the city council workmen. Let's go in. You can see over the front door that the borough of Cambridge was proud of its new asset. It placed an enormous coat of arms there for all to see. On entering, men went to the left and women to the right. Each had a waiting room and a lavatory. The pay office was in the middle. At the back, the laundry room, which was used, which used heat from the boiler to dry the laundered towels. What was permissible, as you can see, was strictly regulated. The interior plan looked something like this. This was drawn in 1978 after the bathhouse had closed, uh, but it gives you an idea of the layout. The baths were opened with great ceremony on the 3rd of February, 1927. The mayor and burgesses all attended and bought tickets, but did not actually take a bath. They were there for the speeches and the lavish tea, which was served afterwards. All did not go to plan on opening day. The baths were to open to the public from 5 p.m. Ben Benstead, an apprentice from Victoria Road, who had been born in Guida Street, thinks he was the first paying customer. He recalled that there was a problem with the boiler. He was told that there was no guarantee of hot water, but he could have a lukewarm bath. Lukewarm, he said, forget it. My first real bath and it was stone cold water. This did not put him off. He continued to use the baths for six years until he married and moved away. We have no photographs of the interior of the building from this time, 
but it must have looked something like this. Each cubicle contained a bath, a mirror, coat hooks, a seat, and a duckboard mat. They were well scrubbed and spotless. The boiler provided hot water, but there were no taps in the cubicles. Water was controlled by an attendant from the outside. The user did not control the flow, save to shout out for more hot water. You had to be careful to get your feet away from the fill pipe. Monica Smith recalled it was quite a performance to get the temperature right. Mrs. G reported that they gave you so much hot water you thought you might drown. The bathhouse became a social centre. The waiting rooms full of cigarette smoke and card games. Tramps from the workhouse at Ditchburn Place sought a warm refuge and stayed all day. By 1969, the baths were running at a loss of £2,000 a year. Hoping to turn loss into profit, the council decided to introduce a sauna. The men's section was converted into a sauna bath lounge and restroom. The remaining women's section would be used by men and women on alternate days. The meeting hall in the bathhouse today still has the vertical wooden strips on the walls, which must have given a log cabin effect. In 1973, the Cambridge Evening News wrote a piece about Molly May, who ran the baths and the women's sauna. It had become quite a club. Women took in their lunch boxes and stayed all day. Molly made them tea and read their tea leaves. She loved to listen to Jim Reeves and Ingelbert Humperdinck while doing the housework. The financial system was bad again. New baths were available at Parkside Swimming Pool. The building was closed and in 1977 was offered to rent as club rooms, meeting rooms or other non-commercial purposes. The St. Matthew's Neighbourhood Association was formed. It used the building and financed its works with regular waste newspaper collections. The paper was stored in a hut at the back and soon became a smoking den for small boys. The hut had to go. When the bathhouse was threatened with demolition for a car park in 1978, the bathhouse trust was formed and it took a lease. Groups took pickaxes to the interior and cleared out the baths and the sauna to open up spaces for community use. The sauna became the hall, the women's bath and office for the tenant support service, and Friends of the Earth used the old laundry as an office. In 1982, it had become a real community and activist hub. The space was used by Friends of the Earth, the Community Relations Council, Cambridge Youth Club, Gingerbread, the Community Press, Cambridge Claimants Union, and the Neighbourhood Law Centre. The Cambridge Dark Room and Marine Action joined later. It has remained a community building to this day. The interior has been changed many times in the last 40 years, but there is still evidence on the walls of the tiles which once graced the bathing cubicles, the hatches into the pay office, the roof lights and the ventilation system. Today, the building is just waking up after COVID-19 lockdown, the staff and volunteers of LifeGraft, the main user of the building, have continued to provide mental health support to its members throughout lockdown by telephone and computer. But the art classes, singing, counselling, communal suppers and social events must wait. The building does not lend itself easily to social distancing. So for now, we must remain outside. The Mill Road History Society uses the building for, com for committee meetings, talks and workshops. We look forward to seeing you all there again one day soon.